program entitled Scaling Up or Expanding Out, What Happens When Development Programs Grow, and more specifically, what happens when population health environment programs grow. My name is Sandeep Patal. I'm a senior program associate here with the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Wilson Center. Today's event is brought to you as part of a cooperative agreement we have with USAID's uh, Office of Population and Reproductive Health. And we look at the various connections between health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. In addition to being the formal memorial to our 28th president, which brings the worlds of academia, policy, and practice together, the Wilson Center was recently voted the top think tank to watch in the US and one of the top 10 in the world. So thank you for helping to ensure that we get such ratings. Speaking of things to watch, I wanna point out that today's event is being webcasted live. So what that means for those of you in the room, when we do come to the discussion, I'd ask that you use a mic and please introduce yourself and affiliation. I also wanted to point out that we're using the Twitter hashtag pop enviro today if you're interested in continuing with that conversation, um, or simultaneously being involved in that co conversation. I wanted to point out our Wi-Fi password on the side of the room. If you have been here in the last two months, you might need to uh, re-upload the username because the password does change. Uh, before I direct your attention to our esteemed um, speakers, I, I had a few thoughts about this session when we were preparing for it, um, especially because there's so much discourse now happening around the SDG process. I was thinking back to 2008, actually. I think that was the first PHE conference that I went to, and it was entitled Scaling Up um, around PHE. And then I was thinking that it's, it's almost been exactly a year um, that the, the group of us, or quite a few of us in this room, were in Ethiopia at the PHE conference as well as the International Conference on Population uh, excuse me, <laughs> that just comes out, um, the International <laughs> Conference on Family Planning. Um, uh, and we were talking about scaling up then, too. And it struck me that I'm not sure we all have the same understanding of scaling up. So we're going to start things a little differently today. We're going to start with an audience question. Um, and I know a lot of you in the room, so I would suggest that people volunteer to answer that question. I don't call on you. Um, does anybody want to offer the definition of scaling up? Do we need a common understanding before we go further with this meeting today? Come on, I know you guys. All right, <laughs> over here. And can we just get the mic? Sorry. I didn't warn my colleagues with the mics that I was going to do this. So apologies, <laughs> Moses. Um, I am Selwa Bitar from the Evidence to Action Project. And I work with a community of practice for scaling up. We're struggling with a unified definition for scaling up. And uh, however, in general, the common understanding for scaling up is we're, we're moving towards something that is deliberate, not spontaneous. And um, it's a deliberate effort to scale up a best practice or something that works in a country to benefit a bigger number of people with the word sustainability in there. Like it should be sustainable scaling up of something that works in a country to benefit a big number of people. That's our general definition, but we're still struggling and we haven't arrived to the final definition. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Would anybody want to add to that? Hi, my name is Moshmi Chaudhary. I'm with the World Resources Institute. Um, I'm actually working on a scaling up framework to see how climate change adaptation options and activities can be scaled. And what we're trying to do is, um, at the moment, divide scaling into two processes, one vertical and one horizontal. So in our minds, horizontal is really re related to replication and expansion, whereas vertical is much more about policy change. So there could be multiple pathways and tracks and, and definitions on scaling, but it has to be a lot more nuanced. Hmm. You actually, um, you hit the nail on the head. I was thinking around vertical and horizontal. Um, did a little bit of Google searching before the event too, and that's actually what came up on Wikipedia's website as well. <laughs> um, does anybody else want to add to it? Um, 
Otherwise, I would just um, add one more caveat to our discussion moving forward. You talked about sustainability. Um, and as you may know, the Environmental Change and Security Program is now part of a larger uh, program on global sustainability and resilience. So I want us to think a little bit about that second word in our, in our new programming's title. And, and can resilience be the new framework um, to help practitioners and all of us plan for for growing PHE programs in the future. So I now want to um, direct your attention to our esteemed panel that I referenced earlier. Um, more detailed bios are available outside the door if you didn't already grab a copy. But we're first going to hear from Gladys Kalima Zukusuka. She is the founder and CEO of, uh, CEO of Conservation Through Public Health. Um, it's also a vet, so we're going to hear a little bit about her journey with the PHE process as well, given her um, educational background in Scotch. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, good afternoon everybody. I'm very happy to be back here at the Wilson Center. Am I speaking well? Uh, you might be more comfortable okay. here and then you can see your PowerPoint. Right, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for inviting me and I'm excited to be back at the Wilson Center. I'm going to talk briefly about the work that we're doing in Uganda, PHE mainly in Uganda, and then also talk about how we've started to scale up or expand out, as you said. I like the definitions, and I think everything that has been said so far applies to what we're trying to do. So basically, I'm going to talk about how we're, we tested our PHE project at Bwindi with support from USAID. Um, how we scaled up the intervention to other locations, expanded the approach through other organizations within Uganda and regionally, and recommendations for the future. Uh, as Sandeep mentioned, I'm a vet, and my very first job as the vet, as a veterinary doctor, was to set up the vet department of Uganda Wildlife Authority when I graduated from London, Royal Vet College, and the first animal I had to work with was one of the most critically endangered in the world, which is the mountain gorillas. Um, very exciting and daunting task. And one thing that struck me when we started working there is that the gorillas lived in an area where there was a very tight, hard edge between the forest and the community. So in 1992, when it was created as a national park, basically the community was told that they can't go in, but it's hard to stop the gorillas going out because it used to be part of their land. And there's no buffer zone around most of the park. So this is the situation around most of Buindi. It's also a place which has a very high population growth or population density, 200 to 300 people per square kilometer, and people who have very limited health services live in this area. However, they're benefiting greatly from guerrilla tourism, which began over 20 years ago. And it's an act of parliament that some of the money from tourism has to go to support the communities around the park. 20% of the park entry fee, $5 per gorilla permit. It's now recently going up to 10 in about a year's time. And so the gorillas are very important for the country, and we're pleased that because of all the conservation efforts, um, the numbers have gone up recently to 880, both in Uganda, Rwanda and DRC, Windy and Virunga National Park. However, we are very closely related to the gorillas. We can make each other sick. And one of the first cases I had to deal with was a scabies skin disease outbreak in the mountain gorillas, sarcoptic mange, more commonly known, which was eventually traced to people living around the park who have very little health care. Of course, you may wonder how do the gorillas and people get in contact with each other, but people, gorillas go outside into people's gardens, they eat their banana plants. Unfortunately, they destroy the whole plant because they're looking for the pith, but in the process they find dirty clothing some of it people put on their scarecrows to chase gorillas and other wildlife back to the park. And so I actually took this photograph when I just come out from tracking a group and these kids were there. They, they didn't go to school that day and it's very common. So they don't have much of a future. But that's the situation in Buindi. Most people live in that situation. And so um, having seen that gorillas, scabies was traced to people living around the park when we held some health education workshops with the community, they came up with very good suggestions of how we can improve the situation. And mm, a lot of them were, they wanted health services brought closer to them. And that's part of the reason why we started conservation through public health. 
Our mission is to promote conservation by enabling people, wildlife and livestock to coexist by improving their health and livelihoods in and around Africa's protected areas. We started in Uganda. And then the vision is for people, wildlife and livestock to live together in balance, health and harmony with local people acting as stewards of their environment. We have three integrated programs, wildlife conservation, community health, and sustainable or alternative livelihoods. Um, gorillas are very similar to us. They carry their babies on their back when they get to a certain age. They are also better than us in family planning. They have a baby once every four <laughs> years without any modern family planning. And chimps are also the same. Um, so we carry out a census once every four years to see if there's a change in the gorilla population. And when I say this to people in Uganda, they can't believe that an animal can, they can learn from an animal, but that's one very good way that we learn from our close, closely related cousins. And the wildlife conservation part, very briefly, is we look, we try and prevent zoonosis, disease between people and animals, animals and people. And we've looked at various things, including Jadia. The gorillas are crossing a dam that was built inside the park to try and provide water for the community, uh, supported by GTZ and Unido. And then people also use these same water sources, so do cattle. And we want to look at things like that. This is a gorilla research clinic we built in Bwindi. Um, we're now fundraising for a larger center. And so we look at diseases in gorillas. We look at pathogens in gorillas, livestock, and people who are sick through a partnership with the hospital. In the community health program, we prevent and control disease transmission. Um, in my last year as the vet for Uganda Wildlife Authority, before I decided to go to North Carolina and do a zoo medicine residency and a master's in specialized vet medicine, I was asked to develop a health education program for the community, which was a turning point in my life because I got to understand how the public health system in Uganda works. And we developed brochures in the local language. Most people can read and write in the local language. We gave them to the local drama groups later when we started CTPH. And so now they're at one of the schools, Cheshero, and then we use that same message to develop flip charts to the community. This is Hope leading a health talk in her community. So we have um, village health and conservation teams who are people. We built upon the Ministry of Health structure of village health teams and added conservation. And they go out to communities and educate them about good health and hygiene practices, family planning. They actually get communities to take family planning. Some of them give depot. Um, some of them distribute pills and condoms. They identify people who are sick and refer them. TB, scabies, HIV, diarrhea. Um, nutrition, they're promoting good nutrition, conservation education, and human and gorilla interaction. They, they record where houses are being visited by gorillas. And then the Uganda Wildlife Authority and Human Gorilla Conflict Team chases the gorillas back. But the very important thing is that they carry out monthly data collection, which Ministry of Health uses and Uganda Wildlife Authority users. We added family planning. Um, USAID approached us to add family planning because we already had that CB DOTS, TB Community-Based Direct Observation of Treatment Program. So USAID invited us to, asked us if we could add family planning onto that. And that really was a whole opportunity to see how public health systems work. And during this time, we were able to then have the village health teams one per village who were selected by the local leaders. We actually got people who were not doing health or conservation. We taught them to do both. But as we started scaling up, we found that now the village health teams had taken shape. And so we just taught the village existing VHTs to do conservation. Um, so we're really building upon an existing structure. And so these are some of the flip charts we used. Um, the good family and the bad family, which was something new for me, who had come from conservation field. And of course, the bad family have many children. She's about to have another baby. She still has, all of these are her children. Um, half of them are going to school, half are not. When we did a survey with Mbarra University, before we started the PHE program, they, t they said people would say that we have 10 children, half are for going to school, and the other half are for chasing wildlife from the garden. So that's a PHE issue in itself because those who don't go to school will never have a future. And then eventually, they drop out of school, they become teenage pregnancies, some of them die early. When the gorillas come out, they try and chase them by themselves, and it's a disaster. But then the good family, 
when they're young, they plan how many kids are they going to have. They decide to have four. In our, in our particular skit, it's two boys and two girls, which helps. <laughs> and when the gorillas come out, they call the Hugo out, Human Gorilla Conflict Resolution Team, to chase them back. And eventually, the boy becomes a ranger, the girl becomes a nurse, and they have a graduation party, and you say, which one would you rather be? And these flip charts were developed in consultation with our community volunteers, so it's very close to the reality of what happens. So even if the National Park, some of the money from revenue sharing from tourism goes to build schools, those people who are really suffering with so many children don't go to most of the schools. And then um, the community-based Depopo Vera partnership is something that we developed in partnership with FHI. We're one of their pilot sites. And because of our volunteers and others from four other NGOs around Uganda, we were able to prove that lay people can give injections safely. Um, and sh it was scaled up. It's now become a national policy. And so this has really ex accelerated the uptake of family planning in communities around Uganda, er not only around the national parks, but in the whole country. And this is a hospital, local government hospital. Uh, Dr. Lynn Gafikin, who helped to set up the PhD program, we took this photograph with her, based on her experiences in Madagascar. And these are all the volunteers who we work with. Luckily, half of happen to be men, and half happen to be women. Then we also carry out PHE for the youth, um, where we talk to the children about the same things, and except it's slightly modified for the youth. That's our two staff working here. And we also carry it out through the Kids League. We trick kids to learn about PHE through sports. So they don't only have to win the game, but they also have to pass the quiz. And we're sustaining them with uh, income livelihood projects, like cattle and goats, which they've reinvested into village saving and loan associations. We've given them bicycles and cupboards, and they're, they're continuing without donor funding. So we've had a 12-fold increase in new family planning users. 60% of the women are now in family planning, above the national average. And other increases, 50% increase in hand washing facilities, people are referred, and men are more involved in family planning. With conservation, we've had uh, reduced human and guerrilla conflict, reduced disease incidences, women and youth are more involved, and we've had improved conservation attitudes, which is what we're trying to measure more closely. So we now feel we have a sustainable and scalable model, which we've started to scale up with funding from the Global Development Network, where we won an award last year for scaling up a social service delivery model. Um, Global Development Network is supported by the World Bank. We were able to scale up to another district around Buindi, who had VHCTs but no VSLAs, and now it's become a sustainable model. And we feel that it's something that is ready for scale up. We want to, we have VHCTs in DRS in Virunga, who we want to also add the VSLA so that it can become sustainable. In DRC, they actually have to buy family planning supplies, which makes it harder for uptake of family planning. And going to advocacy in Uganda, um, the PHE Working Group started in 2007 with support from PRB. And looking at all the indicators, our population growth rate is still growing. We just had a census. It's very high. Um, but most people use charcoal for cooking, almost most of the Ugandans use charcoal for cooking. And so all of this is very closely related and we feel that by working with other groups, we can address these issues more effectively. In November 2010, we had our first PHE workshop to introduce it. And at the time, the Minister of State for Environment was Honorable Jessica Rio. She's now the East African Community Deputy Secretary General. And she's helping to advocate for PHE within the East African community based on this, which is great. This was supported by FHI 360. And then we had other workshops, media study tours, which PRB has supported. And we currently have about 20 active members and a website, pheworkinggroup.org. Population Secretariat is the chair of the steering committee. Um, CTPH is currently the secretariat. And we've carried out a lot of advocacy. And in 2012, when we're celebrating 50 years of independence in Uganda, we wrote an article. Uganda's population, health, and environment, where we after 50 years of independence. 50 years ago, there were 7 million people. Now there's over 35 million. How are we going to cope? The vision of the PHE Working Group is a country with healthy populations, sustainably managed environments, and secure livelihoods. And the mission is to provide a leading role in advancing sustainable development 
through PHE. The goal is to increase broad-based support for PHE integration and implementation in Uganda's development and conservation agenda. Some of the objectives to champion PHE at subnational, national, and international levels, to mobilize resources for PHE integration in Uganda, to promote cross-sectoral collaboration and partnership for PHE, to strengthen capacity, um, to generate and disseminate knowledge, and to act as a forum for sharing lessons on PHE nationally and globally. The members of the working group, there's about 20, some are from the public health and some are from conservation. We're trying to get a good balance. We have a number of government agencies involved, Ministry of Health, National Environment Management Authority, Uganda Wildlife Authority, Population Secretariat who's heading it. And just to talk briefly about what some of the members are doing, the Brindia Mugahinga Conservation Trust has replicated the model we started in two parishes, which have a lot of human and gorilla conflict, to other parishes, which don't have so much conflict, um, supported by Path Foundation. And basically, they had already had VSLA groups, and they've taught them to do PHE. And the, v the VEDCO, which is Volunteer Efforts for Development Concerns, is an agriculture NGO. And they found that introducing PHE has really helped them to improve farmers' access to reproductive health and family planning services. So it's something that's really making a difference as far as promoting sustainable agriculture and family planning together. Then the HOPE project, implemented by Pathfinder with local partners ECHO and Oceanella in Kenya, and assistance from PRRB Expandent and Balanced, is also carrying out PHE. The City Beach was an advocacy partner. They are working with village health teams, making them village health and conservation teams and also putting up model households and continuing to scale it up both in Uganda and Kenya. And in the Lake Victoria Basin, it's not only overfishing, but deforestation, which is a very big problem. Um, regionally, we have teamed up with the Lake Victoria Basin Commission, and we're developing a project to scale up PHE around Mount Elgon National Park. Um, and they already have a conservation program and we're helping them to integrate by adding family planning and human health, both on the Uganda and Kenya side. We're going to scale up the VHCT and VSLA model. They're going to scale up the model households and working with all these different groups, the wildlife authorities, Nekeki, based in Kitali in Kenya, and the district local government. And then with the East African community, um, they're very interested in PHE now, based on all the advocacy efforts from HOPE to Lake Victoria Basin Commission. And CTPH is part of the technical team developing a five-year PHE strategic plan for the EAC partner states, which is very exciting. It's being supported by USAID East Africa. So on my final slide, um, I want to end on a happy note that the president of Uganda has finally endorsed family planning. Um, at the end of July, there was the very first national family planning conference supported by UNFPA and other partners. And he publicly endorsed family planning in the context of demographic dividends, which was very exciting. Um, he did say that family planning is not good or by its own, but you have to bring in health, education, livelihoods, and then it makes sense. And so at this very same conference, it was based on, I gave a plenary presentation um, and other presentations, but they recommended that conservation organizations should work with Ministry of Health to increase access to voluntary family planning where we work because that's where the services are least, but we actually work in areas where there's remote communities, which was a great plus. So the time, the environment is right for scaling up PHE in Uganda and East Africa. So we'd like to continue to advocate for it. Um, also, there are groups like the Poverty and Conservation Learning Group who are very interested in family planning as a way to reduce poverty in the home. And we want to work with research and higher learning institutions to build the evidence for PHE including operational research. And I, having done this work for about eight years, PHE, it's very difficult to fundraise for PHE because it's too many moving parts and it's easier for donors to just fund what they know in single sector approaches. So we may have to look at look fundraising for PHE by going to different sectors maybe and getting each of them to fund whichever part they're normally used to funding. I don't know, but it's just one of those things which We've had a lot of thought about. Maybe in this audience you can give us some ideas. I want to acknowledge very many people we've worked with and um, we want to thank you all. Please visit these websites for more information and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.
Thank you. So I, I think um, several of Gladys's comments spoke to some of the definitions we heard earlier. She talked about replication in other parishes, working in communities um, that were dealing with issues around overfishing to now working in areas where deforestation was an, is an issue, um, looking at lake regions scaling up then in mountainous regions. And so I, I think that we, we did hear a bit about um, her work uh, and her partner organizations work with policymakers. Again, that was something that came up in the definitions. Um, but it did it did strike me though when you were speaking that you talked a bit about youth, gender, community mobilization, and those are some of those words I think we're hearing a lot about um, a lot of when we're thinking about the sustainable development process and how how to identify indicators around the work that we're doing. So um, I definitely think you you gave us qu plenty of fodder for our discussion, including your comments at the end around fundraising by sector. So I'm looking forward to, to opening that conversation up to the broader audience in a bit. And then, of course, you talk, told us about gorillas and family planning, and I had no <laughs> clue. So <laughs> I, I, I have to say that there's usually a moment in every meeting where something resonates, and I always remember that meeting because of that. That might be the one from this meeting, but you know, we'll see if <laughs> Carolyn or, or Roger, uh, Roger Mark changes that, or maybe we'll have multiple this time. <laughs> um, so we're now going to hear from um, Carolyn Savinsky. She is the DFE Program Coordinator for Blue Ventures, and she's um, joining us today when she should be having a little break from Blue Ventures from Madagascar instead of being on vacation and celebrating the wedding that she's in town for. She's here talking to us. So thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much, Sandeep, and a, a big thank you to the Wilson Center for hosting this really important and really exciting session today. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here with my esteemed colleagues, Sandeep and Gladys and Roger Mark, so thank you very much. So I'm going to talk now uh, about a really exciting time that's happening at this moment as we speak in Madagascar, um, where we're building on a very rich history of PHE and scaling it up throughout the country. So first, just to give a little bit of context, um, Madagascar is widely known as a major important biodiversity hotspot throughout the world. 80% of the flora and fauna found there are found nowhere else in the world. And we also see a very high dependence on natural resources among local communities, and of course, increasing pressures on local ecosystems. Uh, Madagascar has a very wide range of habitats, both terrestrial and marine, and these are all experiencing significant degradation. Madagascar is also facing very extreme poverty. 92% uh, of the population lives on less than $2 a day. And at the same time, about two thirds of the population are experiencing food insecurity. We're also seeing a very significant unmet need for family planning. About three quarters of a million women in Madagascar uh, want to be able to plan their families but are not currently using modern methods of contraception. And so we're seeing rapid population growth, and the population is estimated to double by 2040. But in addition to these uh, integrated challenges of environmental degradation, unmet family planning need, rapid population growth, food insecurity, we also have a very rich history of population health and environment integrated and innovative programs throughout Madagascar. I'm also aware that a lot of people here with us today have been involved throughout this uh, amazing history. So I'm just going to give um, some, some key points from this process. So over the last 25 years, we've seen a growth of uh, initially integrated conservation and development projects that then started in the 1990s and by the mid-1990s started to also incorporate voluntary family planning services. And then during the 2000s, um, USAID worked to create the Environmental Health Project uh, which included also a very large-scale evaluation of the PHE approach. And one important thing that came out of this as well was the creation of Buhari Salama platform. And this was sort of an initial uh, um, mechanism in Madagascar to uh, unite PHE approaches throughout the country. Also during this time, JSI worked to create the Champion Communities Program, which really worked with communities to um, identify needs both in health and environment and set their own targets uh, to meet these. Also during this time, we saw a lot of really large-scale 
projects, PhD projects being implemented by conservation organizations, health organizations, and then over the last five years, five to seven years, uh, a lot of these programs ended. We also had um, the political crisis in 2009, which really changed the environment in Madagascar in terms of implementation and funding um, for PHE. But interestingly, also during this time, we saw the creation of a lot of smaller PHE programs um, implemented by, for example, Blue Ventures in the southwest of Madagascar, working in partnership with Marie Stopes and Population Services International, as well as the partnerships between Conservation International and Nitan Nsika, which is a Vuhari Salama platform member, and most recently between the Duke Lemur Center and Marie Stopes Madagascar, working around Marajeji National Park in the northeast of the country. So Blue Ventures has now been implementing an integrated population health and environment approach in the southwest of Madagascar for seven years, which means this is currently the longest standing PHE program in Madagascar. And we're seeing uh, great successes with this program. Communities that before we started this work were having to walk the length of a marathon to access basic health care services. And we're also experiencing great threats to traditional livelihoods through um, through unsustainable natural resource use are now able to access services in their community, able to have a voice in conservation of their natural resources. Um, they can get information, counseling, and services right in their village. And what we've seen as a result of this program is uh, a five-fold increase in the contraceptive prevalence rate from 10% before the program began, which was below the regional average and also below the national average, now to 55%. Um, which is well above the, the national average. And so th this means that uh, the number of women using contraceptives at that time uh, has increased more than fivefold. And so now, based on that work, Blue Ventures has been able to replicate these models that we've created in the Southwest across other sites throughout Madagascar. So just uh, uh, further north along that same western coastline in Belu sur Mer, we now have conservation programs, alternative livelihood, livelihood programs, and also community health work. So this community health part was implemented in 2013, allowing us now to reach an additional 10,000 people across 10 villages. And we're building on these experiences and lessons learned that we've had in the Southwest. We're also now looking in the Maintiranu Barren Isles <laughs> area further north along that western coastline and conducting a, a broad needs assessment and we'll decide based on that what we can implement, what is locally relevant, and how PHE can, uh, can be implemented in that area as well. During the same time, we're working in the Andava Duaka area where we've been implementing PHE for seven years to conduct a realist evaluation. And this is kind of a new way of looking at evaluation of PHE and something that will help us to figure out how PHE is working in this area and what, what it is that makes this work and makes us able to see the outcomes that we're seeing there. And we hope that this will be able to inform the way that we can replicate uh, these programs in other areas and the way that we can also scale this up. So this is, I think, a great visual representation for how we see this happening. Um, so we've used the Nautilus shell to sort of visualize how we see the process from program development all the way through to facilitating adoption. So we start in the center of the shell with developing programs that can be monitored and evaluated and that we, we can um, adjust to see exactly how they can function best. And then as we have those programs developed, then we move to the second step of proving scalability and sustainability. And so when I talk about scalability here, I'm talking about increasing the impact of these programs. And so that, of course, involves increasing um, geographical area as well as institutionalizing these programs, both vertical and horizontal scale up as was discussed at the beginning of the session. Uh, so we're now looking to, to prove both scalability and sustainability of these models and then of course transi transition into complete handover of these programs so that they're not just community-based programs but obviously completely community-led and community-driven programs. So of course a big part of that is involving youth um, investing in local communities and youth to be involved in programs from the beginning, to have a voice in how they're run and to become champions of this work um, as, it, as it grows. And then finally, we move into facilitating adoption, the, the widest end part of this Nautilus shell here. And 
so we don't see Blue Ventures as becoming this huge organization uh, implementing PhD projects all over the place, um, but rather we see ourselves as being in, in a position to support other organizations, both large and small, that want to implement these models. And we can work with them based on this entire process of the Nautilus shell, what we've experienced and learned from development all the way through to facilitating adoption and support other organizations to implement these. And so you might be thinking, okay, that looks like a really nice diagram, but how does this actually work and has it actually worked? And I'm happy to say, yes, it has worked and it's working well and we have some really uh, exciting recent experiences. Um, the Duke Lemur Center and Marie Stopes Madagascar who are now partnering um, in a great cross-sector partnership around the Marajeji National Park. They were able to do this without any dedicated PHE funding. Um, this works well in areas where conservation funding and health funding already overlap, and they've been able to very rapidly um, coordinate and integrate their services so that for Marie Stopes, this is really beneficial. They can reach very hard to reach communities, very isolated areas where they wouldn't normally reach. For Duke Lemur Center and their conservation work, it's allowed them to work in a very comprehensive way, build trust with the community and respond to the community needs in a in a holistic and comprehensive way. So there are a lot of different factors right now supporting uh, this renewal of PHE in Madagascar. Um, one really important part of this uh, is that PHE is now receiving endorsement from the new democratically elected government. So this has just happened over the last year. We're, we're in um, a very promising time after a very um, fragile few years. and. Uh, and this government is uh, enthusiastically behind PHE. We also have very committed practitioners from a wide range of backgrounds and experiences, uh, and communities, of course, are fully behind PHE. This is uh, a, an approach to sustainable development that meets their needs in the way they're felt. People don't live their lives in silos. PHE addresses health, um, it addresses conservation and livelihoods all together. So this is not something necessarily new at this time within Madagascar, but it is a really important part of um, growing PHE. <coughs> and third, uh, we have a lot of recent experiences of cross-sector partnerships that are working, like the one I just mentioned about Duke Lemur Center and Marie Stopes. And finally, we're, we're seeing engagement from a wide range of donors now. So building on all of these factors in this um, exciting time, we. Blue Ventures worked with Vohari Salama platform to call a meeting at the end of July um, of a wide range of um, conservation organizations, policymakers, practitioners, donors, and we brought together 35 uh, representatives from 35 different organizations to talk about PHE. And this was a, a two-day meeting in the capital to talk about what our experiences have been, what the future could be, how we could learn from each other, talk about successes and challenges, and I hope that many of you will have a chance to talk to other people who are at this meeting so you don't hear it from me alone, but this was not your average meeting in the Capitol. There was a tangible excitement and enthusiasm throughout the whole meeting, and it was clear that this was the time. And so together at that meeting, we all worked to discuss what the objectives will be for the Madagascar PHE network, and also came to the agreement at this meeting that yes, we do want to start a PHE network in Madagascar. So together we came up with four main objectives for the network, and these are to facilitate new partnerships and coordinate PHE activities uh, throughout Madagascar. Also to build the technical implementation capacity of member organizations. So this was something that was identified by a lot of people that we just want to have uh, stronger capacity and more confidence and comfort with, um, with the technical aspects of, of PHE. And then third was to demonstrate and communicate the impact of PHE <coughs> together. So this is something I think that within the field of population health and environment is often talked about as an area that we need to improve on. Uh, so together, this network can help us to communicate um, consistently and communicate with each other as well as um, nationally and internationally, and also to help us demonstrate the impact of PHE, something that we often talk about is not always clear. And finally, fourth, uh, the PHE network will help to engage with policymakers, donors, and other networks. And in terms of other networks, we, 
we want to engage with other networks in relevant technical areas that already exist within Madagascar, as well as learning from experiences in other countries that are doing this, like Gladys's work in Uganda, the PhD network in Ethiopia as well. <coughs> and so finally, to bring this all together, we are currently in Madagascar building on a very rich experience, 25 years of experience with PhD in the country, and really taking advantage of a number of diverse opportunities that currently exist. Um, we're hoping to broaden the funding base, something Gladys also mentioned, um, and we're really working to develop models that can be applied but also very adaptable. So we want to understand through some of this evaluation work as well, what is it about these models that makes them work? What is applicable in other areas and how can we adapt this to local context, which is of course extremely important. But that way we can know what it is about this work that is having this impact. So I'll leave you with a couple of resources. The uh, www.phdmadagascar.org is the website that's been created with the PhD network and it's a fantastic place to get information and resources about PhD um, across the world. It also has a, a great map that shows all of the partners in the network and where we're based and what kinds of work they're doing. Uh, it also has a, uh, a report that my colleague Laura Robson just created. It's a really comprehensive document that talks about the history of PhD in Madagascar and can be really useful for us going forward. Uh, and it also has the proceedings from the first meeting in July. So I encourage you all to visit that website. And thank you very much. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I, I certainly heard a few um, concepts that we heard from Gladys in your presentation, um, you know, involving youth, endorsement from the government, having a wide range of partners. But what was interesting is that I wrote uh, in quotations from Gladys that she said, the environment is right. And you had said, this is the time. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's any irony to, to both your thoughts around this being um, really the time to think about uh, how scaling up works um, in our current context around sustainable development goals, resiliency, et cetera. Um, I also um, hope that when we get to the discussion, you can talk uh, to us a little bit more about what was measured in those community assessments because, or those needs assessments. Um, well, that is a community assessment, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, I think when we're, we're thinking about scaling up in different regions, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what, that th what those needs assessments entailed. Um, now we're going to hear a little bit more um, about um, resiliency and how that might factor into this equation from uh, our Roger Mark D'Souza here at the Wilson Center. He's the Director of Population Environmental Security and Resilience. And my boss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Sandeep. Um, you know, it's always dangerous to follow Gladys and, and Carolyn. <laughs> 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 wonderful stories and wonderful images. And mm -hmm. I think as, as we think of, of what they have shared with us, I remember um, two recent community champions that I met. Um, the first is this young woman, Birhani Fakadi, from Ethiopia, who is a PHE, Population Health and Environment Model Farmer. And when I asked Birhani about her experience um, working on PHE, she said to me that it really helped build her resilience as an individual and helped build their community's resilience. And she spoke about having a sense of trust within the community that the community that she lived in was able to mobilize itself, that she was able to access reproductive health family planning services that led to her empowerment, and that translated into her thinking about food security, and that helped build her resilience. And it, it, I was reminded of Birhani's story just a few weeks ago when I met Daniel and Daniel is an environmental justice coordinator in New Orleans. 
And we at the Woodrow Wilson Center were there as part of the meeting of the Society of Environmental Journalists looking at efforts to rebuild in New Orleans and what it meant. And Daniel lives in the Vietnamese community that is, is recognized as one of the most resilient communities in New Orleans that actually did not leave when Katrina occurred. And Daniel said to me, you know what? There was really a sense of trust within our community that had been developed by this Roman Catholic priest who served to mobilize the community and provided services for us to meet our food needs at a point when we had been redlined by the community, we were going to be raised as a community. And this is really helping to build the resilience of our community. And I said, oh, he kind of sounds like Birhani. <laughs> so there are lots of similarities between these PHE programs and these resilient communities. And I think when we think about the linkages, that there are opportunities to think about scaling up and expanding out, and what are the similarities and how we can build on that. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that today and start with this resilience conceptual framework. Now, we know some of you have started to look at resiliency programming, and you may be aware of some aspects of this, but really starting at the context, so looking at a social system or community, and looking at how that system or that community responds to immediate shocks or long-term stresses, and how that system or community responds, given their level of exposure. So they may be livelihood assets that they use that help them respond, and that helps absorb some of the shock or long-term stresses. They may be structural processes that help them adapt and, and, and rebuild coming out of these shocks, or they may develop alternative livelihood um, strategies that help them transform as a result of these shocks and stresses. And ultimately, that is affected by their level of sensitivity to these shocks and stresses. So the, the lower their level of sensitivity, very often we find that these communities or systems are able to progress to a point where they can bounce back better or they bounce back through what we call a resilience pathway. If they have higher sensitivity or susceptibility, they go through um, a process where they're more vulnerable. And we talk about this in terms of a vulnerability pathway. And sometimes they recover, but they may be worse off than before, or they may collapse. And when you look at this from a livelihood perspective and you think of livelihood outcomes, those communities or systems that are able to bounce back better or bounce back may have food security, adequate nutrition, environmental security, and those who are not may experience food insecurity, malnutrition, and environmental degradation. So this is a little bit of the framing of resilience and resilience programming that we are all trying to understand now and get a handle on. So what are resilience programs? Typically, resilience programs integrate livelihoods, disaster risk reduction, and climate change adaptation into a single framework or approach they focus on building the resilience of individuals, households, communities, or higher level systems like a, a socio-ecological system to deal with shocks and stresses. And they focus on ca uh, capacity building. We talked about this absorptive capacity, this adaptive capacity, and this transformational, transformative capacity. And these capacities are seen to be mutually reinforcing and existing at multiple levels. So generally, when we talk about resiliency programming and we look at the key, cri key criteria and characteristics of resiliency programming, this is what the literature <laughs> and program reviews talk about and discuss. So some examples. Mercy Corps has a micro-insurance catastrophic risk organization project in Haiti that looks at insurance payoffs that are explicitly linked to shocks. So it provides an opportunity to look at the effects of shocks, 
tied um, by an intervention that's meant to develop absorptive capacity. Catholic Relief Services have worked in Kenya, and they're looking at the impact of droughts on livestock and its related effects on livelihoods, and what this means to the restoration of goat herds, which have been lost as a consequence of drought, and looking at how do you deal with that as a way to strengthen absorptive capacity. And another example, CARE has a Pathways to Empowerment program working in multiple locations, looking at resilient livelihoods tied to agriculture for women, particularly women smallholder farmers. So this is once again an example of investing in human capital with a focus on women as a dimension of, of resilience capacity. So when I think of these programs that we're beginning to understand from a resiliency lens and framework and beginning to, to examine from that perspective, it seems to me that PHE makes sense for building resilience. When I listen to what Gladys um, and Caroline have been talking about, it seems to me that PHE programs, population health and environment programs, strengthen community resilience by reducing shocks, maximizing livelihood diversification opportunities, creating community involvement and trust, improving governance structures, strengthening women's involvement in decision making and positioning them as agents of change or agents of resilience. And it's interesting, when you look at the resiliency literature, you could almost remove this heading. And these are very often mentioned as key characteristics of resilience programming. And we know that these are key characteristics of PhD programming. So an opportunity here. So how does this relate to scaling up? I know we had some good discussions about definitions of scaling up. I, I often go back to a paper by Cooley and Cole um, that talks about scaling up and presents a scaling up framework. So they talk about it in terms of expansion, so in increasing the scope of operations, replication, and collaboration. So we've talked about this a little bit. And in terms of the five dimensions of extension, so expanding out, they talk about expanding geographic coverage, um, expanding the breadth of coverage, the depth of services, client type, so reaching new categories of clients, and problem definition, extending the current methods to new problems. So when I talk about scaling up and expanding out, these are the dimensions that I, I think we saw reflected in our discussion, and I have in mind in thinking about how PHE can be used, um, can, how we can talk about PHE in the context of scaling up and expanding out using a resiliency framework. So I'd like to make three key points with regard to this. First, there's enough of a shared basis conceptually and in terms of points of intervention for resilience approaches and PHE to make the case for scaling up and expanding out PHE as a resiliency approach. And, and Gladys, this may be one consideration when you're thinking about the funding challenge. Mm -hmm. The second point. When you look at the criticisms of resiliency, and there are many, I think PHE programming very often is not known by um, experts who look at resiliency programming and a contribution that the PHE field can make to resiliency specialists is to think about how we can help them deal with the critiques of resiliency approaches. Some of the critiques that we see very often, resiliency has a very poor treatment of power politics and the social dimensions of their programming. And I think this is an area where PHE programs traditionally do quite well, that resilience is incremental. It doesn't stop to consider step changes or transformational components. And finally, that there's, um, there's some questions around resiliency programming. Resiliency of what? For whom? By what? Are there winners or losers? What are the trade-offs? So these are some of the criticisms you see in the literature and program reviews on resiliency, and I think PHE can actually help inform these resiliency programs and provide some basis. The third point I'd like to make is very often in the PHE community, we struggle 
with how we can measure our impact on PHE. And I think that the PHE field can look at how the resiliency field is beginning to think about monitoring and evaluation to see if they're valuable lessons for us, given this, this commonality that we have conceptually and programmatically. So resiliency programming in terms of M&E tools is looking at the social, economic, historical, and physical conditions. And I'll share just sort of one example of a community-based resiliency assessment tool that has a baseline situation and a crisis period, and is looking at key interventions over time. How does this community respond to stress and shocks? What are the household adaptation and change mechanisms? What are direct interventions? Or what is the external policy and political context? And how does that affect the ability of this community to bounce back, bounce back better, recover, or collapse? and then sort of the repeat monitoring that's being used for these resiliency programs. So I think interesting examples, not necessarily all of the answers, but I think a common basis for us to be looking at these types of programs and seeing how this can inform our scaling up and expanding our efforts for PHE. Similarly, uh, resiliency programming is looking at community ranking and scoring in this spider web approach, looking at the basis of, of various axes, social, financial, financial, human, physical, and natural, and getting a sense of where a community is to be in, uh, fully resilient, where it is normally, where it is currently, and where is it in that red web at the moment of stress or crisis. And how do you determine from there to make programming plans? So this type of spider web capacity building analysis has been used for development programming before. It's not unique to resiliency programming, but I think if it's being used for resiliency programming, it might be interesting for the PHE programs given the stress on the community-based approach to development. So, I think it carries some implications for us. Framing PHE as a resilient strategy could help scale up and expand out the PHE approach and help advance resiliency approaches of major donors and actors such as DFID and USAID, who both have resiliency programming. Positioning PHE within the resilience frame can also help advance the resiliency field and make a contribution, a positive contribution to that field. So PHE has an opportunity to help, and PHE can also benefit from looking at um, key program monitoring mechanisms. So I think if we go back to Birhani and Danielle, and we want to draw parallels between these programmings and these communities, that we can then use that as the basis to position population, health, and environment integration as a resiliency strategy. It's so important, I've named it number one again, that we can explore the ways that PHE programs help deal with issues that resiliency frameworks address or miss, which are very often resiliency programs inadequately deal with gender, and PHE programs do very well at this. And then finally, recognize that PHE and framing of PHE as having co-benefits to both the resiliency and sustainability spheres offers an opportunity for framing, positioning, and fundraising around scaling up and expanding, expanding out. Okay. Thanks. So Raja Mark was tasked with, um, with the question, can resilience offer a new framework um, for thinking about growing PHE programs? And I would say that he has me slightly convinced there. Um, but I, I think some of the things that he said in particular that struck me were um, around, you know, the PHE community looking at the resilience community, especially their efforts around M&E. Um, because as much as we've been talking about in these 2008 PHE conferences, the 2013 PHE conferences, the same way we've been talking about scaling up, we've also been talking about how do we measure this, how do we evaluate this. Um, and, and then vice versa, how you talked about how, you know, we heard all the work that PHE programs are doing around gender empowerment, whereas that might be an area of resiliency programs can really learn from, from, uh, from us as well. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that, that it seems like that that resiliency can offer a new framework moving forward. Um, I do want to open up um, open up questions or offer the audience uh, opportunities to to 
pose questions to our speakers, but I do want to take advantage of having a microphone in my face um, and ask um, our f the first couple. Um, and this, these, this first one, unless Roger Mark wants to add to it, um, I was particularly interested. I mean, we heard a lot about the the benefits of scaling up um, and the ways that that both. But the programming was scaled up both in Uganda and as well as in Madagascar. But I guess I'm curious um, to hear a little bit about the challenges encountered um, in, in both areas, in, in Madagascar as well as Uganda. So I don't know if one of you wants to take that first, um, if, if you could expand a little bit more about around challenges to scaling up. Yeah, Other than funding. But you can expand <laughs> on funding, too. Funding. <laughs> no, you can expand on that, too, of course. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, of, of course there are certainly challenges. I think uh, one challenge being just ensuring the continuation of programs long term. Um, because if we continue to have short term projects, it's really hard to, uh, to get to the point of seeing such an impact that it then catalyzes further um, scaling and expansion. Um, of course, looking at differences in context is also a challenge. Um, it's something that we're trying to look at in terms of creating models that can then be flexible and relevant and ensuring that none of the, um, none of the replication or, um, or adoption happens without s first starting with a clear needs assessment and basing programs on a local context, um, but using some of these same approaches that can then be, um, be molded. I think I think probably another challenge is that a lot of uh, organizations are hesitant to go outside of their comfort zone, so to speak. So conservation organizations are hesitant to start doing uh, health work and might think that it's going to look like mission drift if they do this. Um, and so that's when we were looking at how partnerships can create um, sort of more comfort in this as well as uh, looking at ways we can communicate PHE so that it's clearly understood uh, as an effective approach rather than mission drift. Yep, I think you've kind of answered what I wanted to say. Maybe what to add is it's very important that whatever you want to scale up is sustainable, and that's been the biggest challenge. Like, for example, we've we tried to build the same teams we had in Kanungu district of Buindi in Tukisoro district. So we did, we did develop the village health and conservation teams who we kept adding different interventions to do. And it was good while we had the funding. Same thing in Virunga National Park in DRC. But once the funding ended in uh, Kisoro and Virunga, then the volunteers were a bit demotivated because we couldn't meet with them regularly. And they kind of stopped doing as much work and then eventually stopped doing the work. Whereas in Kanungu, because from the beginning, it's a bit like think about sustainability and scaling up from the beginning of the program. But because these volunteers just came to us and said, please give us a livelihood project. And the donor who we had at the time, actually it was USAID Population Office here, where the group who they gave the funding through were willing to change, you know, shift the budget so that some of it went to buying them goats and cows. When the funding ended, they still continued the work. They, d they complained a bit because we couldn't meet with them as often, but when then they began to realize that, hey, this is a benefit. We have a business. Um, we are really doing well in our community, and they're very grateful when you have a testimony, and that's all they talk about. So I think it's a very big thing. But now that we got some funding to strengthen the groups in Kisoro, we met them again and told them, guys, you have to have an income generating project and strengthen it further with microfinance. We, they are now continued and they're very happy. They're continuing the work. So it, it basically shifts the responsibility from you who's trying to set up the program to the communities to keep it going. So sustainability is very important for, for being able to scale up. And I think as Caroline mentioned, um, some of the organizations in the working group are a bit reluctant to take on PHE as much as they think it's a great thing. Not so much them, but they have to convince their directors, executive directors, um, who make the major decision. Because, I, again, as you say, they can see it has mission drift. I think it helped with the Bundi and Mugahinga Conservation Trust and VEDCO that they applied for some funding from PATH. Linda can... From the, uh, the balance project, sorry. 
um, and the Balance Project supported them. And actually, one thing BMCT said is they got interested in doing PhD because of us, which is great. And so it's hoped that we can actually spread the model to other parishes where we weren't working. But then they also told me now that the funding from PHE ended. How do they keep it going? But as long as we keep talking about how important it is, I mean, I think you have to look at things like creative fundraising, mm -hmm. you know, and, but it has to be a policy change with, within their organizations that they become PHE, organizations which are willing to embrace PHE as a strategy so that they use it as a fundraising. So yeah, that's, that's also a very important area. Cindy, can I add a couple quick points? <laughs> no? <laughs> yes, no, go do. ahead, please. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. And Caroline and I were talking about this um, a few days ago. You know, if, if, if you think back to this population health and environment, this PHE field, it's a young field. And I, I, I think of Sandeep's question 15 years ago, when we were talking about this and what were our challenges then. And I think for me, when I reflect back and I see what were really the salient question and challenges then are no longer as salient now, they're still important, they're no longer as salient now, is a clear indication that this field has moved forward and is having an impact. And I think of three specific questions that we would have answered to your question 15 years ago. And one of the first ones we would have said in terms of scaling up was data comparability mm -hmm. across scales. You know, how do you do that? We would talk about census tracts and administrative systems and ecosystems and how you compare that data and how you overlay it. That is no longer a concern now because we're using more GIS, we're doing more participatory rural appraisal techniques, we're empowering communities to gather that information. And I think that has been a positive development towards scaling up and expanding out. The second question that plagued us 15 years ago was, how the heck do you do this? <laughs> there were no models out there. So you may still have partners saying, how do we do this today? And we say, ah, let's give you a series of six different approaches depending, depending on your context. We didn't have that 15 years ago. So we were talking, do we use an integrated approach, a parallel approach, a staggered approach, and what does that mean for scaling up? And that was, you know, we would be going round and round in circles trying to figure out scaling up in terms of the model to use. And we might still have those questions, but we have a history, a, a community of practice that has shown faith failures and success, and I think that's a clear indication. The third question for me is around political will, and I am so thrilled to have Blue Ventures doing this work in Madagascar. Madagascar was at the forefront of PHE integration, as Carl Lang showed, you know, 13 years ago, 15 years ago, and then it went into a lull, and it's back up again. It is still there. So why? That has been driven by the programming in Madagascar that started with the communities that in a very community-driven process decentralized to a certain degree where you're able to demonstrate short-term wins that have political saliency for decision makers for that period of time. It's still a challenge, but it's much less a challenge now than it was 15 years ago. So I think um, we, we talk about this field now, and I think we sometimes forget how young we are and how much we've accomplished in a short period of time. So I wanted to add that perspective. Um, so you just got yourself a little bit in the doghouse because <laughs> you like to tease me and say that I often expect you to be in my head and just pick up a conversation that I've been having with myself. And I literally wrote, what is different now? And that was going to be my question <laughs> to you. <laughs> so you next go. time, just know why I think you're in my head when you um, clearly are. So that was going to be one of my questions to you. Um, I do, again, want to make sure that we do um, get audience questions, but I... I I want to make sure that you all have a chance to ask each other questions, too, before we open it up, if you have any for each other. Or we can open up and you can give that some more thought, too. I think, I think probably also, um, just also just to add on that, is that the government buy-in 
is very important. Um, so it's not seen as a, another NGO project, which is going to run by itself or come and go with donor funding. But if the government also puts it in within their structures that we have this particular point person who's going to be doing PhD related issues within our structure. I mean, like for example, I'm, we're trying hard to get um, Uganda Wildlife Authority, it's a good test model, because I'm so linked with them right now, I'm on their board. <laughs> but trying to get them to have, you know, like PHE people within the community conservation department so that they can be the ones who then champion PHE. Because already they have seen it's worked in Bwindi, they want it in Mount Elgon, they want it in all the national parks. But how does it become a sustainable thing? So I think that could be another of those challenges. How do you get it to scale, working through the existing government structures? <laughs> and speaking of, of structures, I actually meant to comment um, actually uh, immediately after Roger Mark made his presentation about your point about USAID, for example, working around resiliency now and opportunities um, when we were thinking through fund funding and whether it's approaching, um, you know, different different funders for different aspects of it. I think Roger Mark made an um, a interesting point earlier when he talked about how funders now are, are looking at the resiliency framework in their upcoming programming. Um, I did see a couple hands go up on this side, so um, if we could uh, collect both of them and then give the opportunity um, for the panelists to respond. So, And again, please introduce yourself and affiliation. Thank you. Uh, Philip Allen. I'm an independent consultant. Uh, um, uh, addicted to Madag Madagascar. <laughs> <laughs> After uh, those pictures, I am too. <laughs> very, ple very pleased with what, with what uh, Blue Ventures has been able to accomplish uh, in a place that seems uh, naturally built for PHE, uh, mm -hmm. particularly the H with the, with the, with the Prime Minister, uh, who's also the Minister of Health and is also a doctor. But he may not be Prime Minister for very long because our congratulations about Madagascar may be over um, with the, the President who was uh, m largely responsible for the progress that you were talking about, Roger Marc, uh, now in jail. Um, so we, we don't know. Um, the, uh, the government has been unable to provide uh, f substantial funding, um, although the budget is to be decentralized, and that would be a big help for any PHE, any good PHE program, if it gets the funding. Um, but it hasn't been able to tax, and it, doesn't, it hasn't been able to draw external funding. And so my question to you, Carolyn, is uh, how, how resilient, oh, by the way, there was nothing more resilient, Virginia Mark, than the way Malagasy communities uh, re reacted to an almost six-year-long crisis. Um, and it was remarkable. So mm -hmm. um, how, uh, how resilient is, uh, uh, is Blue Ventures and, the, and, and Blue Ventures' colleague uh, uh, organizations to a p potential a new crisis, prolonged, without World Bank, without uh, Euro European Union, without the French, et cetera, and be perhaps without the Americans, since the Americans are strong supporters of the president who is now in jail. Yes. I think um, right across, um, we had a question from Linda, if I'm not mistaken. I, I wanted to talk about some of the challenges that the Balance Project had, in particular with seed grants and the, the two that Gladys mentioned um, in Uganda. Uh, WIV is a uh, cooperative agreement, so we weren't supposed to uh, implement in country unless we did small seed grants for trying out different models. And we tried out different models in a number of countries, and Uganda was one of them. But because projects sometimes get started late, and by the time you find the right partner, et cetera, et cetera, we ran out of time, so if we ever do seed grants again, or if anybody considers them, do the first year of the project, get them going, and because there's always kinks. And one of the big challenges with PHE projects is that they're far away. They're, you just can't go to the suburbs and, and do a training and come back. Sometimes it takes $500 just to rent a taxi to go out to some of the very remote places, as Gladys knows. So they're time consuming. They're very dependent upon weather. If you have monsoons, et cetera, et cetera, slows down activities. So PHE in particular has more of a, a, a time challenge because of the remoteness of the organizations. Um, so that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, I will talk about the Zambia project. Um, which also PG, uh, family planning was brought into a large food security um, a, uh, organization, um, operation. And they've continued 
to sort of dabble at bringing in family planning. It's been slow, but you know, I think one thing that's really important is besides funding is really having that organization endorsed, like Gladys has done and CTPH and Pathfinder have done this, is not only was it just a project, but it actually is our mindset and we were going to do PHE and Blue Ventures has done it too and they've, they've really sort of pulled things together with Band-Aids sometimes, but they, they have kept at it. So it's really an organizational endorsement. It was just not a project. And we found that on the Balance Project, when we had seed grants or organizations that actually endorsed it operationally as an entire organization, that that, that that worked. I mean, all projects go up and down, as we know, funding cycles go up and down. But that was the key and will be the key, mm -hmm. key to success and PHE's resiliency. I think you bring up a, a, a good sure. point when you talked about um, the challenges and distance being some of them. I know one of the ways that we see our, our PHE partners on the ground succeed is by by working with you know conservation and health organizations, both who have challenges going out to communities and, and whether that's carpooling and, and things around of that nature. Um, Etiana? Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, Etiana Scazzaro with Population Action International. And thank you for this uh, conversation. Two questions. One is about funding. And I was excited to hear, Carolyn, the example you referenced of uh, two distinct organizations who were able to integrate this work without specific funding to address that work. And also thinking about a conversation Gladys and I had just this morning about um, a funder who was interested in, who was funding, let's say, the conservation portion of the work, but was interested in the indicators and the improvement around fertility rates and things like that. And, and so it seems like there might be a, a level of need for education of donors about this work and the need for this work and what, you know, if you work in conservation space and you're con in familiar with conservation indicators, what does, you know, TFR and other family planning indicators, how, how do you contextualize that for them in terms of uh, demonstrating the, the work that you've been doing? The second brief question is uh, thinking about scaling out and um, how to apply PHE, which has been grounded in conservation for many years, to an urban setting. Um, and how, you know, in the spirit of resilience, in the spirit of defining a, a model in a different environment, how that might work. So, thank you. Great. So um, perhaps we'll hold on some other questions and give our panelists a chance to answer. I know, uh, Carolyn, there was a specific questions around uh, Blue Ventures and its resiliency as well as its partners to a potential new crisis. Uh, and then we had a question about the education of donors um, and then scaling out in urban settings. So I don't know if, Caroline, if you want to kick us off and then, and then the others can join you. Sure, thank you. Yeah, an extremely important question about um, resilience. Uh, and I think some important points have already been, uh, been touched on. Uh, first, I, I should mention, I meant to mention earlier, that this initial meeting of the PHE network was held under the patronage of the Prime Minister, who is also the Minister of Health and the Minister of Environment. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we had representation he's from... Sorry? He's Minister of both. Uh, yes, he's the Prime Minister and the Minister of Health. He's wow. And then uh, another <laughs> Minister of Environment, ah, yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say PHE Minister. <laughs> <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Um, and we had representatives of, of various other ministries, Ministry of Water, Agriculture. Um, and yes, this development over the, the last couple of days um, does show that things are still fragile, but I think Blue Ventures can show that we actually began working as a marine conservation organization in 2003 and then integrating uh, community health work and alternative livelihoods a few years later. So we have not had any gaps or any breaks in our services throughout that time. And I think a large part of it is uh, because we see this as, as our organization's work, not as a project, and we will find ways to continue it. We also have um, some uh, creative funding mechanisms, including uh, an expedition um, volunteer program, which can help us to support some of our other work when we ha when we have gaps in funding. Um, we also have a very community-based model. We have community-based distributors, and we have um, services that are uh, that are sustainable 
already to the point that they could be carried out um, at very low cost. Uh, and that is something that we're always considering, but we are completely committed to, um, to continuing this work without any gaps and handing this over. Uh, and so I think, as you said, Madagascar is, um, is resilient, uh, and, and there will be ways, and, and as I mentioned in the presentation, we have such impressive, committed communities and practitioners that as we develop this momentum in PHE, I think it will be less about conversations about projects and programs and more about how can this become an approach that's integrated and there no matter what, uh, what the situation is. Of course, we need commitment from all sides, um, uh, but I think we are at the point now where, where it's, it's there to stay no matter what. Gladys, do you perhaps want to address the, the donor education piece? Yes, um, <laughs> I had the conversation with Tiana this morning about that, and I really feel strongly that donors need to be educated. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, yes, we're really grateful for the funding that donors are able to provide, but I think things are always changing on the ground. And when you're working on the ground and you're seeing things changing, it's a very dynamic sector. Conservation is very dynamic, public health is very dynamic, sustainable community development. So it's good that we have to keep educating the donors because I think we just think that they know what's happening. So when we submit a proposal, we assume they understand. But actually, I think it's more of not just them, but us. We need to educate them. Like when I talked to Tiana about the issue of, you know, a conservation donor asks, but you've been doing family planning, so how does it translate into less trees being cut? Like they want the solution now, but it's going to take a while. And has the bats, has the bats, has the size of the homes reduced? That's not going to happen in one year, you know. Um, so some of the things, some of the donor projects are one year, and they want to see a result in one year. And some of the PHE impacts or outcomes are going to take even just outputs will take longer than one year to show. But I think it's maybe we need to educate the donors that things take a longer time, so we need longer dedicated funding. And also we need to also educate them that um, to look more broadly about how they define things. Um, I think they had a legitimate thing. They didn't understand what the family planning indicator was. And I kept saying, but we're having an increase in new family planning users. And they were like, they didn't understand what that meant. And I should have p said it in a different way, maybe saying that means people are having babies less often, which means that eventually they will have to not having to go to the forest so often to collect firewood because they have a smaller family to feed. But I mean, it's just we have to improve in the way that we make it relevant to all the different sectors. And that's the hardest thing about PHE. I think it's easier for the health sector because the health sector just wants to promote Family, they want more and more people to get health services. It's very simple. Equity. So as long as you're spreading health services closer and you're using your conservation groups that you work with, they're happy. Whereas the conservation donors are like, we don't want to support something that's development. That's too development oriented. You're reaching more people. Well, how is it affecting conservation? They start to get a bit nervous. Because for them, it's about how is it affecting conservation? How is it affecting biodiversity? And some people have written books saying that when you improve services around protected areas, you draw more people closer to the protected area and you end up destroying it. So there's uh, lots of schools of thought. Um, I've been at primate conferences where they actually asked me and this particular person who I, I really admire. Um, he had his concept, he even wrote a book about it. And then I had my concept of it's very important to improve services. So they got us both to give plenary presentations um, at that conference. And actually, then we realized that actually we're moving closer to understanding each other. He's like, he said, it's good to provide services, but it's how do you do it? And I'm like, yeah, I could see that whole fight between conservation and development. It's a constant fight. But I think PHE can address it as well. Yeah. If I can offer and then also you m mentioned about scaling out urban communities. Yeah. Actually, with the East African community, the new PHE strategy, it's not because 
East African community works both in urban and rural settings. The, they want the PhD strategy to be about both urban and rural areas. So hopefully this strategy will be able to, will be able to test models in an urban setting through this strategy that the East African community is developing for PHE. It will be very interesting. I'd li like to just build a little bit on, on what Gladys is saying to make two comments. The first is about labels and, and resilience. Um, and I was quite struck by, by your comment um, when you said, you know, Madagascar or, or Madagascar communities are very resilient. Um, I have worked in many communities in the Philippines, in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, um, in Bangladesh, and many of these communities have told me, you know what, we're tired of being resilient. Enough. Enough with this resiliency business. We want to be better off. And this is what I was trying to convey with the, the, the resiliency programming. It's not just dealing with those shocks, absorbing the shocks, it's really building on it, adapting and tr transforming. So that's a little bit of what that programming is. And I, I, I do hear from communities that say, we're tired of being resilient. <laughs> so, you know, those of us who talk about resiliency try to get at that nuance and how do you translate that into programming. So I, I, I share that perspective. Um, to get to Etiana's point about urban, and, and once again, this is also reflected on labels, and I very much appreciated Gladys's point. You know, I sometimes feel that those of us who are in the PHE communities are very successful <laughs> at navel gazing, and we have to get above and beyond that. We have to move out of our own PHE silo. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk about, you know, bridging the silos. So I have worked with urban programs, Etiano, um, that are looking at um, how do you develop networks in an urban setting? How do you develop climate adaptation programs in an urban setting? How do you work in slums in an urban setting? And they work on youth empowerment and engagement and how that's tied to conflict. They'll work on aging and vulnerability of the aged or senior citizens in their community. They work on gender empowerment and education programs for women. And they look at household formation and age structure and what it means for female-led Households. These are not called PHE projects because they're not dealing with reproductive health or family planning service delivery. We in our community here do not call them PHE projects as defined by our funders. That's not a bad thing, but I'm saying that we should be confident enough to challenge ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, I, and you, I don't think it's useful to get into a definition of what is PHG per se, but we were in New York, what, 15 days ago approximately, presenting at Columbia University um, a conference organized on the Sustainable Development Goals, and we presented the PHG programs. And a question from the audience was, Every time you talk PHE, you only talk reproductive health. So I throw that out to us. So I throw mm. that back to you, Etiana, as <laughs> a question <laughs> and a response. No, honestly, you know, does an urban PHE program need to look like these programs? Are there existing programs that are meeting the same goals where perhaps we could bring in a reproductive health component? Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it's necessarily scaling out to PhD programs, it's capitalizing on what's there and what's working and maybe bringing an added benefit to them or reformulating how we talk about PhD. Um, it still gets the woman's empowerment, which is part of what we're getting to with reproductive health family planning. So I throw that out there for consideration so that we don't only talk to each other. Mm -hmm. That's great. Speaking of only talking, I feel like I've only been talking to this side of the room, although I do see one more question. Um, perhaps we can grab um, Kristen's question, and then we have, um, we have three over here as well. So if we could grab all four um, and then um, turn it back to the panel. Hi. Thank you for the good presentations today. I'm Kristen Patterson with Population Reference Bureau. And I'm curious in the Madagascar context if the, the new Madagascar PHE network has been advocating to USAID Madagascar now that they're kind of reorganizing and are, are back in the country to take an integrated approach again 
to their sectors that you know they had a strategic integrated plan from 2003 to 2008 um, prior to the well maybe now perhaps not the most recent um, political crisis but the one before the one that happened this week um, so I'm curious if you've been been taking that approach thank you thank you Hannah saw three or so hands over here Hello again, and thank you for uh, those wonderful presentations. I have uh, two questions, in fact. The first one is, um, there are now many systematic approaches for scaling up, and I heard some, some ideas about systematic, beginning with the end in mind, and so on, but I didn't feel how, how the uh, presenters went around it, like was the scaling up more organic, program related and then flexible, amenable to change, or did you really start from the beginning with some systematic approach? Uh, which, which takes me to my second question, which is the costing of the demonstration and then finding the financing for the scaling up from day one. Like how much thought was put into the costing and working on the financing from the beginning? to ensure this vertical scaling up or sustainability. Yeah. Hi, Moshmi again from World Resources Institute. Um, my question is similar to yours in the sense of I'm, under, I'm trying to understand the different pathways to scaling and how can we better link horizontal with vertical. Um, and I'd like to hear from you in terms of, you know, what was your approach? Did you first have to do a proof of concept through replication and then go to policymakers to make policy changes? Or was it the other way around? You know, what, 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 what were the steps really um, to, to kind of target both horizontal and vertical change? <coughs> Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Jelasek. I'm a professor at the University of Colorado. I'm at USAID working in the uh, lab as a expert on scaling, which I've never done. Um, I'm a <laughs> professor of architecture. <laughs> <coughs> so um, I'm, I'm struck by the looseness, I would say, of the definition of sustainability that we've heard today. Uh, I'm frankly kind of taken aback by concerns about donor funding. I would have thought that a sustainable program would be financially self-sustaining and that the concerns about donor funding would be minor at best uh, in a well-designed uh, effective program so I, I guess moving forward what's the strategy if donor funding dries up to actually do this critical work how do you create a systemic response that ensures the future success of, and and expansion of these these projects thank you thanks uh, um uh, let's do this round, and then we'll try to get this next round in after. So we um, maybe we can just go down the line. There was um, a question directly to Carolyn around the PHE network advocating. Uh, is what is it advocating with USAID Madagascar? Question around systematic approaching to scaling up, or was it more organic financing for scale up? When 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 did thoughts come um, around how to pay for it? Um, and how to better link horizontal to vertical, and then what happens when donor funding dries up. So do we wanna just go down the line? Gladys, do you wanna kick us off? <laughs> you don't have to. Um, <laughs> okay. <just> closest. <laughs> um, I think I'd like to say, those are very good questions from the right side of the room. <laughs> 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 no, I'm saying not that the left, I'm trying to. <laughs> 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 but those are the kinds of, the questions you asked are the kind of things that we've been asking ourselves now in the next phase of trying to scale up the interventions. Um, it's like during, we teamed up with the organization called ExpandNet, which I think you've heard of ExpandNet. They look at the science of scaling up. And I remember the whole project, they kept talking about beginning with the end in mind. And in a way, like, I think we, from when we started, conservation through public health. We always, our mission has always said Africa, although we started in Uganda. So subconsciously we wanted to, to scale up. So even as we started the program, we were always thinking about sustainability, um, making sure that the people we're working with can keep this thing going beyond us. So we endeavor to form very strong partnerships with the government and the communities that we're working with. And I think that has always been inherent within the model of conservation through public health. 
But then the more detailed aspects of how best to scale up, that one has just learned on as we're going along. It's just been a learning experience. But I have to say, like, for example, when the first group of people we met, when we started the PHE program, we taught them to do both health and conservation. Then when we started to do this work in DRC, we found out that they already had existing community health workers. So we even asked the public health nurse in Uganda, should we create new groups or should we work with those and teach them conservation? She said it only makes sense to work with those and teach them conservation. Then when we went to Kisoro, we said, give us your most active VHTs because we're going to give them more work to do. And so I think as we go along, now when we're going to other parts of Uganda where now the VHT sector is very well established, we are not going to just get new people and create, teach them to do PHE. We're going to use the existing health workers and teach them to do some PHE. And so we've already started to engage the village health teams in around near Mount Elgon to teach them to do conservation work. So I think it's, in a way, it's becoming more systematic, but it, so it's a, an element of both systematic and organic, if you see what I mean. That's how I could answer that. And when you talk about both horizontal and vertical, I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that the government owns the program, not only the wildlife authorities, but also the health authorities. Um, although when I said to someone in Ministry of Health that, you know, we want the Ministry of Health to endorse village health and conservation team, she said, good luck. <laughs> but I think they will eventually because they've endorsed village health teams. As long as they see that conservation VHCTs can also help to further the health services to other remote locations, the, the government of Uganda may start to also endorse the VHCTs. So I think it's just a matter of, in Kenya, the equivalent is community health workers and community conservation health workers. So we're just trying to do both the vertical and the horizontal together. And for, as for sustainability, you said you're taken aback that we're talking about sustainability. <laughs> We just need to get your mic so people tuning in can hear. <laughs> I, <coughs> uh, looking at the literature, uh, whether it's ExpandNet or MSI's work on how to scale or Peter Uven's excellent article from 1996, there seems to be no doubt that you don't go to the government after you do the project. You start by co-creating everything within a country that you want to be sustainable. So the funding shouldn't be a question. Or if the funding becomes a question, then you say this is, an o this is a model that doesn't work and we need to stop and come up with a new model. Because while I d have no doubt in the value of the work, if it's not sustainable from the beginning, then you're just going to constantly run into these desperate d requests for continued donor funding when donors are fatigued, have other interests and change. So I, I, I guess I would just, um, I'm surprised that when the issue of sustainability came up, everyone was in agreement, but there doesn't seem to be clarity on what a sustainable approach to scaling looks like. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think PHE as a sustainable, a model which has sustainability, with a model that people would like to fund, we still have to m a lot of progress, I think, in this area. I think Roger Mark also spoke about that. Um, because it's many sectors, and most donors are used to funding a single sector approach. So in order to get donors to break that silo and start realizing that actually funding multiple sectors together is more cost effective than doing it separately, we think we need to build more evidence base for the cost effectiveness of PHE. There's only been one operational research project that showed it in the Philippines, and we would like to get more funding to support operational research for all our projects. Um, and that will really help, because the donors need to see the value added of PHE, both in economic terms, as you said, how much does it cost to go to a different parish, a different district, a different country. And in all aspects, we need to look at, we need more studies. Maybe we need to team up with other groups of people with other expertise to show that. But um, as far as community spelling up, scaling up of community-based interventions, I think we've shown within the PHE framework that some of what we're doing is sustainable. 
and it's being taken up by other groups, you know, like village conservation, health and conservation teams being supported by income generating projects and village saving and loan associations teaming up with microfinance. At that micro level, I think they're sustainable PHE models. But the overall funding for PHE, that one is still one of those things that needs, we need to do a lot of work in building the evidence about the importance of how PHE is more effective than doing things in a single sector way. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, excellent questions, all of them. I'll, I'll start with Kristen's question about uh, the PHG network advocating to USAID Madagascar, and absolutely. Um, we're working with the USAID mission uh, very closely. They were really involved in the first uh, meeting of the PHG network, um, and we've continued discussions with them after that, and we'll certainly be working closely with them, we hope. Um, in terms of how our program uh, organically or systematically grew, and how did it happen? Um, I would say first with Blue Ventures, we saw ourselves as an implementing organization. Um, locally, programs were implemented uh, within the national policy context. So uh, we report directly to um, the Ministry of Health on our uh, community health work, for example. But we're filling gaps at the moment that couldn't necessarily be met. And so we're, we're working quite closely with the ministry now. Um, but this is not yet at the point where they can completely uh, take this over. However, it is completely integrated into their system. So, um, so I'll, I'll tie that into the sustainability financing part. Um, I think what we're trying to do is be really realistic about this and to think that um, complete financial sustainability is not going to happen in a few years. Um, uh, but we're considering all of those steps in con and ensuring that we're working closely and building relationships and maintaining relationships and integrating the program into the ministry system so that mm -hmm. eventually that is certainly our long-term goal for this. Um, and so we started an, in implementing programs and then um, and then, of course, wanted to replicate those programs. But it was in that process, I would say, that we then developed this strong model of how, in fact, we would replicate as well as, uh, as, as expand out. So, um, so again, as Gladys said, I think it was a mix of organic and systematic planning for that. So we certainly didn't plan to work just in, um, in this small area of southwest Madagascar, but also didn't want to simply um, expand something that, that might not be relevant or long-term sustainable. Um, we are looking at, at a, a lot of um, different possibilities for funding in terms of scale up. Um, one thing, like we talked about in the presentation earlier, was uh, the potential for uh, scaling up in ways that doesn't actually require any additional funding. Um, working on uh, ways that we can um, sort of make the best use of these low-hanging fruits and really um, catalyze uh, this process through through ways that don't need additional funding. But, and at the same time, working within uh, national policy as well as regional policy and local policy, because there are ways that, um, that programs can be implemented that uh, that are really dependent on local context just as much as they're dependent on the national context as well. Just so, uh, two, two quick comments. Um, th as in th specifically with regards to your question, I, I think um, early on when we were doing PHE programming, we looked at different models for implementing PHE um, approaches. So we talked about whether we should have a simultaneous approach. So, you know, you're doing the conservation work and then simultaneously you are doing the reproductive health family planning work. And at some point they meet, whether you do a sort of a staggered or phased in approach, you start with conservation and then you bring in reproductive health or whether you do them both from the very beginning in an integrated fashion. And what some of the assessments have shown is that those projects that have focused on the integration from the very beginning have been more sustainable when um, donor funding has dried up. So that the, the staff 
programs and communities involved in those programs have found ways to continue the work because they were vested in this integrated approach from the very beginning. So that's one point. The other point, and I've sat in on these meetings in the Philippines, which of course is a very decentralized system with local government officials who have said to our NGO partners, at some point, um, your funding will dry up and you will leave. And now that you have convinced us that PHE is the way, we, the local governing council, need to develop a mechanism so that we can do this without you. So we are issuing what we are calling a PHE ordinance, which commits the local governing council to continue with PHE integration when our little NGO partner is no longer here. So we have examples of local governing bodies who have budget oversight taking the, the impetus, the, the initiative to put in place a local ordinance that will allow them to continue this work. Now once again, that's very small, it's at a very micro level, but it's a start. But you're getting this kind of response from um, local government saying, yeah, you've, we brought us in and we're kind of worried when you're no longer here, so we have to find a way to do this, which is great. So, but it's, it's in process. Mm -hmm. Your first point is not surprising, though, right? No. Okay. Going no. Going right, but we have to have had to figure that out as a community. Um, so we are running out of time, but I do actually, I want to do something we haven't done before. I want to ask the two people, at least I saw two hands go up, to pose their questions. Um, so, because there's a lot of resources within this room. I mean, I, I look across and I, I see two people, for example, who've also worked at Blue Ventures, one sitting next to someone who has a question. So, or, so perhaps um, if we pose those um, out loud, um, there could be some mingling after the event that can, and, and of course you're welcome to come up to the speakers because they'll still be here. So if we could get those two questions before we conclude. Hi, I'm Marana Mills from the University of Queensland. I'm just interested in how important it was that these programs or uh, these programs or were trialable by the communities. So, so what commitment was required from the communities before they joined into the program, and when could they tap out if they weren't interested? Great, and I think there's one actually right behind there. Oh, right there. Hi, um, I'm, can, uh, I'm Andrea Harris. I'm at USAID. I'm in the PRH office, and I'm a public-private partnerships uh, technical advisor. And so my question to you is two things. We're talking about donors, which I understand, especially when you're working where you are at the intersection between multiple disciplines or sectors. Um, have you taken a look at... Uh, at, at income generating strategies for yourselves and your organizations because that's the longer, I think that's always the longer term solution for the sustainability issue that you're talking about for those coaching organizations that promote the change on, on a local level. Um, the, the other potential is to um, take a look at ways to uh, engage uh, the the local activities as a provider to governments. All of those need uh, enabling environment change. And hence, my suggestion to you is if you can put in your advo advocacy agenda ways to articulate so that donors that do have a relationship with governments or, you know, uh, can, can be helping to push on the enabling environment end and have arti clearly articulated um, rationales for why this is important might be uh, one helpful way to proceed. The, the final question, sorry this is so long, is have you thought about uh, the specific industries in the international context, sustainable tourism, uh, other kinds of the, the, the mobile industry, construction, et cetera, some kinds of ways to engage private actors that will be consonant with your conservation goals and come up with a maybe a team strategy, a network strategy. Great. Thank you for those um, concluding questions. I actually want to thank you all for, for joining the discussion and encourage you to continue to have this, whether it's in the room um, while you mingle or whether it's by following us on our website, 
Facebook, Twitter, or blog. And I also want to ask that you um, join me in thanking our speakers. Okay. Okay. 